This episode is brought to you by AudioQuest, makers of the mythical series Analog Interconnects. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Did you hear me put my coffee down right there on the tiled floor? It's a bit like sitting in a swimming pool. Welcome back everybody, by the way, welcome back. Today, we are going to review my new listening room here in Lisbon. Just to clarify, I haven't moved permanently to Lisbon. I've come here for the winter to escape the Berlin winter because it's dreadful and here it's not. And so I think moving forward, I'm going to be splitting my time between Berlin and Lisbon. Anyway, this room, it is seven meters long and four meters wide. So the long wall is seven meters, the short wall, four meters. I've got a two meter by two meter window here, right in front of me. At the other end, I've got one meter by 1.5 meter window. And then the floor, the floor is all tiled. Nothing I can really do about that. Most homes in Portugal are like this. It's basically to keep them cool in the summer, but in the winter, because there isn't really a lot of central heating because it's not cold for very long. Right now, it's a bit chilly in here. You know, it's just, it's not what you call cozy. We do have a pellet burner, and I think most Portuguese people use portable heaters or pellet burners and things like that, just for the, like the four to six weeks where it's, yeah, uncomfortably cold without a heater. So that's why there's a tiled floor. I'm not sure really how much that's contributing to the audible problem that you can hear on my lav mic here, the reverb, we'll come back to that. The ceiling here is, I think it's a bit more than three meters. It's certainly taller than my ceiling in Berlin because I can reach the Berlin ceiling pretty easily just by putting my hand up because I'm two meters tall. But here I have to stretch a little bit. So all up, really, this is kind of a, a sort of a bigger space. It's more open because I've got a, a little corridor in front of me here, and that goes down to some steps to the front door. And at the other end of the long wall on this side, there's another sort of corridor that goes to some steps upstairs. So there's plenty of room for the low frequencies in this room to breathe. And if you didn't see my last video, the speakers that I have set up behind me are a pair of Zoo Soul 6. They're like a wide bander that runs effectively full range with a kind of pseudo super tweeter running up the top. And they are driven by an NAD M10 V2 amplifier, streaming amplifier, little shoebox thing. And then next to those on the inside, I've got a pair of Bookart A500. They're not passive, they're active, so all the electronics are built in. They are fed by the Platin Hub, which is at the far end of the room connected to the TV box that is, I guess it's more, yeah, it's, it's remotely connected with a very thin translucent wire to the TV that you see behind me, which is a Samsung frame, exactly the same TV model that I have back in Germany. And it's gonna go on the wall eventually, but not just yet. Now, what we're interested in today is how the loudspeaker interacts with the room, a bit like how my voice interacts with this room. I can hear it, you can almost certainly hear it as well through the microphone. You can hear that, yeah, my voice has not changed since I lived in Germany, but what you're hearing through the microphone is definitely very different to what you would have heard in videos that we made in Berlin for the last, what, three or four years? Especially the last two years since I had the room acoustically treated. But for the sake of this video, we're gonna be concentrating on the Zoo speakers, the book arts, mainly because they are pretty much close to full range as I can get as I have here right now. So yeah, these are the only two speakers that I have here right now. So if you wanna know how this stuff sounds with other speakers, sorry, can't tell you, don't know. Now you might wanna know why these loudspeakers are placed along the long wall, along the seven meter wall and firing across the room. There are two main reasons for this. The first is a practical one, is that basically, yeah, my front door is down there and the upstairs is round there and up. 
So this room is a bit of a thoroughfare when we're not sitting around watching TV or listening to music. So the middle of the room has to remain clear. So I can't go putting speaker here, TV cabinet and then speaker there because it's gonna block the entire room. So from a practical sense, that doesn't make, yeah, doesn't make much sense. Although I did try it. I didn't like it at all, I didn't like the sound. It sounded very closed in. So even though I'm sitting closer with the couch on this side and the speakers on the other long wall, I get a much, a much wider soundstage. And I think that's because, I don't know for sure, but I think it's because the side walls are quite a way away now. So this left-hand Zoo speaker has got another, what, 1.5 meters before we hit the side wall here, and possibly close to two meters at the other end. So I've got good side clearance now, which is great for imaging, or so it appears. And yes, that is even true with the TV placed between the speakers. I still get a great, solid and detailed center image, a phantom center. And anecdotally speaking, I think the base in this room with these speakers for the zoos and the book arts, which I know really well, I think it has more room to breathe. I think that's to do with the extra volume of the room, but also the hallway here and the stairs around there. It, yeah, it just sounds more open and fuller, but please take that with a pinch of salt because I am doing it, yeah, from audible memory as to how these speakers sounded back in Germany. But one thing that's not in doubt, one thing that is being caused by the extra volume in this room, the exposed walls, the tiled floor, possibly the window, but I don't know about that, is that there is tons of reverb. A lot of people might call this echo, but it's actually reverb, reverberation. And what that is, is like basically when a sound, let's say a short snap, comes out of a loudspeaker, you could hear it ring there, is that basically it comes out of the speaker and then it'll hit a wall or maybe some of it will hit a ceiling and it'll bounce around, it'll snooker around the room and every time it hits a surface, the sound wave loses energy. And when a sound wave loses energy, it becomes quieter. So it might hit three or four surfaces before it completely dies off in any given direction. So that's how the room effectively extends the lifespan of the sound that comes out of the speaker, reverberation. But obviously the lifespan of that sound, of that reverb, is a distortion because it's not the same sound that comes out of the speaker because it's been bouncing around. So it gets distorted along the way as it slowly loses energy. But we'll come back to that in a moment because what I've been doing for the last few days is using a bit of software called Room EQ Wizard and a microphone, which is just here, called the Umic One to measure how the loudspeakers interact with the room. So what I had to do was put the microphone on a stand and position it essentially where my head would be if I was sitting in my usual listening position. And Room EQ Wizard generates a kind of a frequency sweep and then reports back on, well, we're gonna talk about two key areas today. We're gonna to talk about reverb time, but first we're gonna talk about frequency response. Now I've got my tablet here with a whole bunch of different measurement screens on it. But the first thing that you should know is that I didn't start with two sets of speakers. I actually just started with the Zoo loudspeakers. And just before our IKEA order of a sofa and a rug and other things arrived on the second day that we were here, I took the opportunity to set up the Kallax unit, the TV and the Zoo speakers with the NAD amp and take a measurement of this room effectively, apart from the Kallax and the TV, effectively completely bare. So a completely blank room. And don't ask me what it sounds like without the TV, without the Kallax unit, because I didn't do it, I forgot. So anyway, on the screen now, you're looking at the frequency response of the Zoo Soul 6 in this room effectively bare apart from the TV and the Kallax unit. And you should also know that the graph you're looking at right now is not something that I've reconstituted in my own software. This is a screenshot direct from Room EQ Wizard. And yet, I think it looks reasonably good. There isn't too much of a, a deviation throughout the frequency range. I mean, we can see that the zoos begin to roll off at around 50 hertz. There's a bit of a bump in the mid range around 600 hertz, but it's not a car crash. And one thing that I love is that there isn't some kind of big bass hump that I have in my room in Berlin. Now, many people believe that adding a rug 
and a sofa, but especially the rug, can make a huge difference to the sound of the room. And I thought, being as I was measuring my zoo speakers in an empty room and I was about to take delivery of a sofa and a rug the following day, I thought I was in the perfect position to test that. So the sofa arrived, we built it, we laid the rug, and then I took a measurement again. And so now I've got a graph that shows the Sol 6's frequency response in the empty room, that's in pink, but then also the Sol 6's frequency response with the speakers in the same position, microphone same position, in blue, and that shows with the sofa and the rug in place. Now you can see there's a little less punch in the mid to upper bass. And also that mid-range peak has been given a slight boost. So in some ways, <laughs> with the sofa and the rug in place, it's a little bit worse. So that surprised me, but one thing is for sure, it isn't a dramatic improvement when you put a rug down and add a couch to a situation like this. We need to do more. But here's the thing, the frequency response doesn't tell us what sound is doing over time. And what you're hearing from my microphone here, that sort of reverb that we spoke about before, that's the sound over time. That's what the sound is doing as milliseconds pass. You can hear the, almost the ghost of my voice as it's bouncing around this room, the reverb. And to look at the reverb in Room EQ Wizard, we need to look at something called the RT60. Now I've made a video about this before, and I'll link to that in the description box below. But essentially what RT60 means is the amount of time it takes for a range of frequencies to decay by 60 dB. So a sound or frequency comes out of the loudspeaker, bounces around the room, and then decays over time as it loses energy, as it hits different surfaces. And when it's 60 dB down, that's when it's effectively vanished. So that's what we call the reverb time of that frequency or the RT60 of that frequency. And Room EQ Wizard gives us a reading of frequencies and their reverb times. Now, I do know that from having looked into this before, having made the video before, that many people believe that for a listening room, the ideal reverb time between roughly 300 hertz and four kilohertz should sit somewhere between 300 milliseconds or 0.3 seconds and 0.7 seconds. And my acoustician friend in Berlin, Jesko Lohan, also told me that really you want to see a fairly consistent reverb time across that frequency range, so from 300 to 4K. So if we look at the Zoo Speakers RT60 in this room, and I've got two lines for you here, two plots essentially, one the empty room and then one with the, the sofa and the rug, you can see, I guess the good news is that it's it's reasonably consistent. But the bad news is that that consistency centers around one second, one second of reverb time. That's well above even the upper limit of what's acceptable for a listening room being 0.7 seconds. So we're way too high here. This is why you can hear that sort of echoey sound from my voice on the microphone. Now, in order to explain what one second of reverb time really means, is that if you imagine like a house music track, it's 120 BPM. So therefore it's got two beats per second. Now, if you know house music, you know that there are also probably hand claps on the off beat. So you're gonna get two hand claps per second. So essentially one hand clap will come in and then the second hand clap will come in half a second later. But when you have a reverb time of one second, when that second one comes in half a second later, you're still hearing, your brain is still processing the reverb of the first hand clap because it's still running. And it'll run for another half a second after the second hand clap comes in. And when that second hand clap comes in, it's gonna run in reverb for a second. And we'll sort of mess with the sound of the third hand clap that comes in. A second is a long time in music for your brain to sort out what's going on. A bit like how it's difficult to have a conversation with somebody in a swimming pool. But the other thing we should note from this RT60 graph for the Zoo Soul 6 is that again, the sofa and the rug don't really make any meaningful change or improvement to our reverb time. 
even though many people seem to think they will. So once I'd measured the zoos in the empty room and then with the sofa and the rug in place, what I asked myself next was, okay, would a different loudspeaker give us a different set of results? Because different loudspeakers sound different to one another and maybe a different loudspeaker would couple to the room in a different way, which is why I've got the book out here now because I introduced them later. And what I did was I measured their frequency response in this room, but with the sofa and the rug already in. I wasn't gonna take it out again. So in this next graph, what we were looking at here is the frequency response of the book arts in this room with the sofa and the rug, and the frequency response of the Zoo Soul 6 in this room with the sofa and the rug. And you can see that the, the base extension on the book arts goes a lot further than the zoos. There isn't that sort of mid-range peak around 600 hertz. It's a lot smoother. I think it's quite nice because it sort of starts in the base and just slowly descends. So you might look at that and think, yeah, John's room sounds pretty good. But what we haven't really considered is the RT60 of these two loudspeakers. Now, of course, the book arts frequency response in this room is going to be affected in a minor way by their position because they're not in the same position as the zoos. They're just inside the zoo, so they're a little bit close to the TV. But if we move on to the RT60 of these two loudspeakers, we see that the book art still suffers that one second reverb time in this room, right? Because it's the room that's messing up the sound and there's slightly less of a reverb time from the book arts in the upper mids than the zoos. But again, I don't think the differences are night and day. I don't think one speaker destroys another. I just think what they are both doing is reflecting the reverb problem in this room. You know, one thing about living in Portugal, and I've only been here for a week, is that I never thought I would ever live in a place with narrow streets, with cobblestones on the road, and also where you're never more than a few hundred meters from a barking dog or a few hundred meters from somebody using a hammer or a drill or a few hundred meters from an idling car, which is what I can hear right now. So it must be in the street at the front. Anyway, I did one more little experiment for the benefit of the people who think that the differences that we've seen so far are indeed huge or night and day. And what I did is I took the original A500 measurement in this room and then placed it on top of, so overlaid it on a second measurement where all I did was move the microphone forward six inches. So it, basically the equivalent of like leaning forward towards the loudspeakers by six inches, right? And this graph shows that yeah, the frequency response does change, but no more than really other differences that we've seen already in this video. I mean, in fact, the listening position plus the six inches sees a slight dip in the bass at 80 or 90 hertz. There's a, an extra peak at roughly 275 to 300. So if you wanted to be really nitpicky, we could call those differences out and say they are possibly, possibly worse than the frequency response measured at the listening position. And I also looked at the RT60, so I overlaid these two as well. There is a slight improvement at 400 hertz but a slight worsening at 600 hertz. And in some ways I might say that the, yeah, the RT60 with the six inches added on is a little bit worse than the RT60 taken at the listening position. So really, I think the overall takeaway here is that this room has a very, very serious reverb problem. And somebody commenting on my previous video reminded me of something I thought about about six months ago. Because the dude commenting this morning was saying like, you know, now John, you're in a great position, I think he was being funny, to review sound bars that rely on reflections from walls and the ceiling. And it reminded me of a, a Samsung surround sound speaker kit that I saw about, yeah, about six months ago that does exactly that. It's got two speakers in the rear, two at the front, and it relies on the ceiling reflection, right? And there's an animation on Samsung's website that shows how this speaker fires sound upwards and needs for it to bounce back off the ceiling. And then it also sort of shows the sound curving around the couch, which I found a little bit suspect, but I think what it's really trying to suggest is that sound can bounce off the sidewall and come back. 
But really what I thought was that in this particular case, you need a reverberant room to make that sound system work properly, right? Which I thought was really weird. But I don't really have the time or the inclination to investigate something like that, especially as I'm kind of, I'm negatively predisposed to it now because I've seen that animation that Samsung's made and I've gone, no, don't like this. But we'll end this video with a poll that I ran on the community page of this channel about five months ago. And I never reported on the results. Basically, I asked, which one of these scenarios would give you the better sound? Only two. The first one was a $1,000 hi-fi system playing in a fully acoustically treated room. Or, number two, a $10,000 hi-fi system playing in an untreated room. Thankfully, of the 10,000 people that responded to this poll, 10,000 people, that's a lot, 80% recognized that the $1,000 hi-fi system playing in a fully acoustically treated room would give the better audible result. And what I'm showing here is the opposite, right? I'm showing the 10 grand system in the acoustically untreated room. It's not great at all, you know? And I can laugh about it. Well, for two reasons. Number one, I don't think hi-fi is ever a life and death situation. So I don't think I ever need to talk about it in those kinds of terms, you know, as if, as if every small change for the worse is some kind of calamity or any small change for the better is some kind of come to Jesus moment. Because neither of those things I find personally to be true. However, yes, the reverb time in this room is a disaster, but no, I don't have to wait long to sort it out because Vicoustic, who did my room in Berlin, are a Portuguese company. So of course they were going to be my first choice to ask if they'd come and do this room here in Lisbon. And they said yes, and they're coming next week, I think for two days, to kit out this room with acoustic panels to make it sound better. I've already seen the, the visual mock-up and I think it's going to look better than what I have in Berlin right now. I really do think it's gonna look a lot nicer, even though, yeah, it's gonna be visually intrusive because here's the thing, a sofa and a rug aren't room treatment, not even close. Not even if I had like a, a few other bits in here, like a bigger chair and maybe a big cushion somewhere, a floor cushion and other shelving units full of CDs and vinyl, it still would not be enough. It isn't. I mean, maybe it would reduce the RT60 by a tenth of a second, maybe. But room treatment means treating the room, and that means the entire room. And as I've said many times before, that also includes the ceiling, which then rules me out for reviewing that Samsung surround sound system that I mentioned previously. So this, if you like, is the before, the before video of that treatment. But between now and installation day, I also have another opportunity with this room sounding as horrific as it does right now. In that I chose the Book Arts also for a reason because they have inbuilt room correction. So I'm going to see if Book Arts room correction can do anything to improve the sound of those A500 speakers in this room. But I also chose the NAD M10 V2 deliberately because it comes loaded with Dirac Live room correction software. So I'm gonna get my friend and colleague Terry Ellis to help measure this room with Dirac and see if we can improve the sound of the Zoo speakers in this room. And when I say improve, I don't mean the frequency response, I mean the, the reverb time, the RT60. And that's what we're gonna be covering in the next video. But if you liked this video, if you thought it was helpful, informative or entertaining or a combination of those things, then please consider giving this video a like down below. If you like my attitude towards hi-fi gear, and especially the room, and I cannot emphasize this enough. If you've got a pair of loudspeakers, the room is more impactful on what you hear than anything else you have connected to those loudspeakers. The room will influence the sound more than any change in amplifier, change in DAC, change in streamer, change in phono stage. I think even change in room correction software, but we're gonna find that out in the next video, so I don't wanna preempt those results. But I have my, yeah, I have my, I have my doubts, I guess, really, but we'll see. Anyway, if you like my attitude to all of this, then please consider subscribing to this channel, and as always, thank you ever so much for watching.